this is a Chiron. This is the new Bugatti Chiron. It's a 2019. Uh, and it's basically white is sitting. Of course, we always mod everything. Mm -hmm. It's sitting right here on HREs with baby blue calipers. This is a 918 Spider Porsche. This is a max rhodium paint with a, a red interior. Uh, blue Glocko, which is Tiffany blue. Uh, this is paint, not a wrap. Uh, Huracan STO with Anarchy wheels. On this side, we have the new 4 GT in the back. And then uh, 1998 uh, 4S993. Nice. With very, very good amount. And my daily driver here, the only uh, ever in America, Brabus uh, Ghost 2022 Black Badge. Welcome back to the 365 Driven Podcast. We've got a repeat guest coming back. He's actually one of the earliest episodes and also one of the highest downloaded episodes of this four years now because he really talks about unconventional thinking and he's very unconventional with a lot of things that he puts out there. And what I love about PJ is that he's very polarizing, but he's very polite around his way he's doing things. He's not trying to disrespect people when he has these comments that he puts out there. He's really direct. And you guys know I'm very direct. That's probably why I like this guy. So welcome back to the show, Pejman Gadimi. He's a founder of a lot of different things. He's a very uh, diverse entrepreneur. He's into real estate. He's got exotic car hacks. He got the academy. He teaches people how to buy and sell and flip and hold these exotic cars to make a profit or maybe even enjoy them for free for a year. He does this also with the luxury watch market and some other markets. So we'll get into those kind of things and you guys stay tuned for a good episode here. So welcome to the show, brother. Hey, I appreciate you having me back on. A very welcoming uh, intro because I was going to say I am kind of rude to people. <laughs> Depends <laughs> on your definition of direct versus rude. <laughs> well, if you're if you're listening to the show and you drive a Maserati Ghibli, you, you probably won't. Oh, like that's this not episode. good. You no, probably won't like good. this episode. <laughs> you know, but I fight. I fight the fabric. Uh, like with every bone in my body, I fight poverty. And I hate it. And and I'll tell you something. And, you know, we, we can start by just talking about this just discussion around it. But, you know, people always tell me, why do you break around, like people's balls so much around Ghibli's and Corvettes and things like that? And, you know, growing up, I was really poor. I mean, if people watch the first episode, they, they kind of know that. And, you know, I also had Mustangs and I also had Corvettes and stuff as dreams and aspirations and stuff. The The problem is there are two types of people. There are individuals who own these things and understand their stepping stone to, to getting to where they need to go. And there's nothing wrong with that. To buy a Corvette because that's all you can afford is fantastic. But then there's this other person who basically uses the justification to basically not go anywhere else as a result by saying, I bought this. Uh, over a McLaren because of this, when in reality, they never had a choice to begin with. So those are the people that I have a problem with. I don't really have a problem with a Ghibli owner or a Corvette owner or someone who makes maybe a, a car choice regardless of what their budget is or what they can do. But this is the problem. And I think one of the things we, you know, that we see in society today is that manufacturers have done such a good job at capturing that for people, right? Like, it's like, hey, here's a the best Nissan special edition. And you're like, well, it's still a crappy Nissan. I'm supposed to drive a Nissan and get out of the Nissan phase, but this manufacturer has given me a reason to basically stay stuck here. And, and when people buy into that marketing and continuously like re-echo that messaging, it just bothers me because it's counterproductive to human evolution to stay stuck and to justify failure rather than just move forward. So anyways, my rant for the day. If I no, I get it, man. That. You know, actually, last week on Facebook, I created a post and I said that a exotic car or a fancy car or a fancy material should not be your goal. It should be a reward for achieving a much higher goal. What do you think about that phrase? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, I don't, I don't even think materialism needs to be looked at as, as a goal by any means or, or not even a reward. I'll tell you, how I've always viewed life, because even from a young age, I've always pushed myself to own nice cars, even if it cost me a lot mm -hmm. or was uncomfortable to my, at the time, uh, what I would call biweekly nine to five pay, right? It was uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I was making five grand a month. I was paying 1500 for a car. It was crazy. You know, people would say that's not reasonable or, or correct to do so. But one of the things I've always looked at as, as when I look at cars, luxury real estate, luxury boats, and all these things, 
I've always believed that human consciousness comes from a place of beauty. So, the, you know, there's this thing about being around beauty all the time that elevates the human mind, spirit, and everything else. An example of that would be when you have great food, like you eat an incredible steakhouse, it's very hard to go back to Outback. Mm. When you hear an incredible orchestra, it's very hard to hear a terrible rap. You know, like what I'm saying is like real greatness, right, from from great artists and artists are not just based on genre and styles, but rather great music, uh, great food, great cars, Things that are built out of passion are things that evoke beauty, not order. Like, like think about what a Civic is made for. A Civic, there's nothing wrong with affording a Honda Civic, but its purpose, even a Tesla, one of the reasons I'm anti-Tesla in that sense, when people try to mimic Tesla as a performance cars rather than just A to B cars that are fast, faster than what conventionally is available, the way I look at these things are these things are made to sustain order. You need a car to go back and forth to work, to get in traffic. It isn't there for the enjoyment or the pleasure of that time, right? So if you ride for an hour in a Rolls Royce versus you ride for an hour in a Tesla, you get two very different vibrations out of life and a very different feeling towards it. One is very inspirational. One is very exciting. One is the byproduct of other people's passions you're touching and other people's mastery of their craft and the other one is basically a mass engineered thing that's basically built to help you sustain order in your life both have very different purposes and the more elevated your mind becomes uh, the wealthier you become the more you're forced to because you're around that environment all the time but the more elevated your mind becomes the more you become dependent on this need of beauty rather than order in order to find happiness, because the more aware and conscious you become, the more you see how the world is ugly and the more you need that beauty to basically facilitate your ability to survive within it. So I know it sounds very uh, philosophical in nature, but that's how I've always viewed cars, watches or art, to, like craftsmanship, mastery mm -hmm. and passion towards things rather than looking at them from a lens of like, oh, I have to have this because... I want to say who's got the biggest dick, you know, coming yeah. across like on a weekend, because at some point in life, you have to realize like buying a crazy Ferrari Pista or a Lamborghini SVJ, there is no real difference. Like these appeal to different people in different ways. This is not one is better than another or one basically is uh, more expensive or s speaks differently of the individual. They're the same thing. You're just a question of taste or a question of style or a question of what beauty appeals to you as an individual. But but I think that's why so many different manufacturers work if the product is quality and it just hits home for what it does. You know, and I think this is very important because a lot of times people see that we're car guys. We love cars. We're car fanatics. We love them. Some people will see the fancy cars that we drive in and they'll think, oh, they're just compensating for something. I mean, we get their, their kind of fixed mindset, right? But I also think that what you said is very profound because- I remember when I was broke, only wanting to have uh, a Honda Civic, like an HX, so I could put 15 inch woofers behind me, right? Because at the time, we tend to like really just favor the things that we can afford, or maybe just a little bit above what we can afford. And, you know, maybe that's a Maxima later on, and then maybe that's a mini truck. And like we kind of graduate through these things, just like you said. And I think that that's cool. I think that I can still appreciate it. I still look at the cars that I used to own, and I can still appreciate things about them, you know? And, but also right. see and there's that, nothing wrong with that. That's exactly yeah. what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with knowing where you come from and also having at each stage of your life something that is there for what it is. Yeah. Where people make a mistake is where they confuse that stage of their life with a need to basically compensate. It's actually those individuals that compensate the most because they're the mm -hmm. ones basically when, when a Honda tries to race a Lamborghini, <laughs> it is the other stupidest thing on the road because it's like, listen, the guy who can't afford what comes as a result of getting caught, right? The one who can't mm -hmm. afford the accident that comes as a result of doing that is the one basically pushing that narrative, which is very dangerous, one. Secondly, you also have this other element, which is reality. The guy with the Lamborghini can buy seven Civics and do exactly what that guy did to his cars and go equally fast. Mm -hmm. But the guy with the Civic can't buy one Lamborghini. So the argument is, who's victorious? If you did go faster. Well, I could have done that too. And it didn't care to, but you can't do what I do. So the argument is always that that isn't necessary. It's just a phase of life and it comes to pass. And people don't hate on individuals who have nicer cars. They want that same lifestyle. 
people tend to be rebellious towards a society they don't understand. They, there is never there is never someone with a path to wealth and a path to success who hates on the success of others. It is those who do not have a path to get there who often find themselves in a conflict internally and mentally where they say, well, since I don't have to have a path to get there, I'm going to justify my path now as to why it's better than that path so I don't have to get there because I don't see that road. Now, if you're in the middle of building your company, you know where you're heading, you see other people around you close their companies and sell them and make millions and have a yacht and buy a Ferrari and this, you get excited for them because that path is there for you too. And you're like, that's so motivational. Like I'm there too. Like I'm, I'm on my way too. I'm also going to have a shot at this and I'm also going to be that person. So you want to see that, that beauty, right? Yeah. I, I tell you, a lot of people take this for granted, but if you look at Asia, for example, we saw the story of Jack Ma, right? Someone who mm -hmm. rose to tons of money only to then have an opinion and be shut down, right? Like, and basically be like, hey, you can't, you can't do that. We take this for granted in the United States that when we see other people's success, when we see other people's uh, voice being heard as a result of their success, we find ourselves in this two-place mode. Either we see a path there and we get excited for that, or we don't see a path there and we become rebellious towards that as a kind of a, a counterproductive issue, right? It's like, hey, you know what? Like, why does this person have this? And I don't, maybe I don't need this in my life to be happy. This is stupid. You know, and that's when we start mm -hmm. hearing justifications for, well, I have a family. Well, okay. Well, what does your family have to do with your yeah. wealth, right? Wouldn't you want more yeah. money? To there, there's no, hey, PJ, there is no rich people with families. I'm sorry to tell you. There's just, no, doesn't exist. All single people <laughs> with 14 we, we all have, we all have five roommates. <laughs> you know? So I just spent all my money on cars. <laughs> yeah, we, we live in our our, our Senna. <laughs> so, now, hey, you guys in Dallas, it's probably he's probably saying some truths that probably hurting your feelings over there in Dallas. <laughs> just letting you guys know in Dallas, okay? Because we see a lot of that Lamborghini roommate guys, you know. So, but let, let's let's talk about that because I think that yeah, I do believe that everybody aspires to have that. Maybe they don't have the path. So let's talk to those people. Like, how does someone that thinks they do not have a path to wealth or success or these things that we enjoy? How do they start that or where do they get that from? So, you know, there is a there is a alignment of the evolution of the human to the evolution of his wealth. And that's a lot of times people ignore that. They want a path to wealth. They don't want a path to becoming a wealthy man. Does it make sense? There's mm. two completely different things. And they're very much aligned. That's why they look for a shortcut. I'm sure if you hear the most asked question of, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18. It's always like, what's the thing next year that I need to be doing? You know, people are always asking like, what's the thing you're going to be into next year so I can get a head start? You know, like, so it's like, okay, well, if I get into, let's say, uh, I want to get into luxury real estate. Well, I'm going to be in a different position than you. So what difference does it make to you? It shouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, like what path you choose has no correlation with what someone else is doing, especially someone who's a lot wealthier than you. So it's, a, it's not going to change, right? But people look for that wealth. They don't look for becoming a man of wealth. And and because it's not sexy, you know, it's just not sexy to tell someone it's a 20-year journey, but it's a very necessary and rewarding one. So the way I break it down for people is basically skill. Like when, when we're new and we don't have skill, like you don't have a path, you don't know what's going on, you don't have any real large skills. What you have is labor. You have the ability to trade your time for labor. So you can get a job and there's nothing wrong with that. So the first sign is that having a job is not a negative. It is an opportunity to acquire skill. Having a job with no purpose is absolutely a negative because you stand there doing the same thing without a reason or a path. So you see, having a path to wealth comes from having a path as a human. Having a path as a human means how do I acquire skills? So therefore, I'm going to take on labor that allows me to gain skills because the path from labor to skill is about five years, which means five years you work places or a place where you develop skills. You get to know yourself a little bit. You go, I'm really good at maybe uh, welding. I'm really good at teaching. I'm really good at leading people, right? Like these are things that I've done in my jobs and I find myself to be overly qualified and gain that understanding much faster. Some of us are great at leading others. Some of us are not, right? We get in a mm -hmm. position and we go, Maybe I'm really good in sales. I seem to be really able to persuade people much easier and I have a knack for it. So then comes the opportunity in that five-year path to go from labor to skill set, which means now how can I develop that skill, right? Like, so now in that five years of development, 
I'm going to go from skill because now I'm doing specifically, let's say sales, we'll use that as an example, was the labor that I found myself to be skilled in. Then I'm going to now practice or keep moving up the ranks or even start a company that is using my skills of selling as the as the main attribute for why I'm going to be successful. And then it is going to give me basically the opportunity after five years of practicing that to now start getting in the sense of mastery, which means that I, for five years, I've gotten much better than most other people. I now have a clear competitive advantage. That is the point where I usually advise people to basically start companies. When you realize what your mastery is, when you realize what your competitive advantage is as a human, nobody can take that away from you. It doesn't matter what your idea is in business because you are the leading factor of your business. So if you have that competitive advantage, someone else that doesn't can't duplicate your business. Basically, it doesn't matter because mm -hmm. they can't do what you do it the way you do it. But the part that this is the part where it gets really hard to swallow for people from mastery to ultra wealth to that level where you're like, oh, I got some half a million dollar car and I don't give a crap. I'll buy another five comes 10 years of mastery into market dominance, which means practicing that mastery and letting the multiples of business hit, you know, hit you with the money. Mm -hmm. So like the 10 years you're making average good money, you have a good job. You're now skilled. You're making better money. You start trending in the quarter million dollar a year range. And eventually to get into the million dollar plus range, it's basically market dominance. It's like what no. business are you going to bring to life that is going to dominate its market and pay you personally over a million dollars a year to allow you some massive financial freedom? Maybe still not airplanes and $100 million yachts, but still give you an opportunity to really be free of the financial constraint that 99% of the world, you know, doesn't have. So what I usually tell people is if you don't have a path to wealth, look for these very easy denominators from labor to skill, skill to mastery, mastery to market dominance. And if you look at it one step at a time, it's much easier to do, even if it's hard to swallow and uncomfortable because you know it's a 20 year journey and it's brutal. But but that's how, that, I mean, that's how every successful person works. And even if someone would argue, well, there's another guy like Elon and he's PayPal picked up in five years, but that wasn't his first thing, right? Yeah. So if you account for everything that happened before that and the years and years before that to lead to that, that's what I mean by the multipliers. That was part of his mastery, but people forget that whole phase at the beginning because nobody documents that phase at the beginning, right? Nobody goes back to their, like talks proudly about their first job like yeah. if we're on this podcast and I told you my first job is telemarketing, like we're not spending an hour talking about that. I may no. briefly mention it, but it's not it's not interesting, right? So it's not what people want to hear about. And that's where the core issues are, is that since it's not documented as much as your success, it's very hard for people today that have just access to very basic social media surface level conditions to kind of understand the depth of something without doing real research. And unfortunately, that's very much lacking in today's uh, instant gratification world. Yeah, you guys are getting a dose of why I like having these conversations with this guy, because he can very clearly explain very complex things to make them very simple. And that's one of the things that you do very well. The thing is that most people, I think that we get to that 100,000 plus range in income and they kind of just get lazy because they don't really believe in what's possible for themselves. Now, there's been a period of my life as well that I kind of fit in that range. And I kind of thought, man, man, sure would be nice to go become a multimillionaire. Like, how do I get there? And I was always asking the questions, but we don't always believe because maybe we don't see the path, right? And I think there's a lot more evidence nowadays on the internet and social media of people who have done that back when I was doing it, when we were younger, there wasn't really that much evidence unless it was somebody that was famous on a bookshelf or on a movie screen. And so you got to start thinking about what is the belief system that you're carrying that limits you from that potential? Because PJ and I will both tell you, like, you can do whatever you want. Like you can create whatever persona, whatever business, whatever success you want. And it really doesn't have to do with your intellect. Cause I've seen some, you, you and I both have probably met some very, very successfully financially successful people that were kind of dumb. I mean, they're low IQ people, but they just figured shit out because Maybe they took the actions that were imperfect and they just kind of were consistent, had good discipline about it. And the results and the opportunities start to come with time. But I also like that you talked that it takes a 20 year run. Most people don't want to hear that, man. They hear 20 years. They don't even want to hear, hear 10 years. Let's be real. In today's society with everything that's instantaneous and instant gratification and disposable, they don't want to wait 10 years. That's why people are buying the fake blue check marks. They're buying the fake press. They're doing all this bullshit out there to try to get ahead. 
because they don't want to hear 10 years. They don't definitely don't want to hear 20 years, but you know, guys like you and I have been doing it 20 years. So, so, so it's, a, it's a risk reward thing, you know, to address the hundred K people that are making six figures comfortable, having a life, it, you get to a place in your life. And this one, I, why I recommend being or starting young, you know, I started working at 14 I tell people mm -hmm. start early, like integrate into society early. So you can get out of that phase earlier than being 40 in a job making a hundred K right. Like the, mm -hmm. The main thing is that you get to a place in your life where basically the reward isn't worth uh, the risk of the loss. So if you're making 100K, you probably have a nice Lexus, you have a nice home. And, and unfortunately, because you don't plan for the future, you only see kind of where your comfort zone is and you go, okay, do I really care for a Ferrari? Well, if I have two kids, how much am I going to drive that? Do I care for it? But you, but you're not you're you're fixated again in justification of not moving forward because of something like the Ferrari is a symbol. The Ferrari doesn't matter. Who gives a shit about the car? Like the car is just a, a piece of the freedom. Like like the way I've always looked at it was when I was poor and I saw someone walk into I had a job a nine to five job at a bank and I consider myself poor. I was making eighty k a year. I thought it was pretty okay at nineteen, but still poor in context to what real money is, right? So, you know, when I saw a guy walk in with a $30,000 gold Rolex and a Ferrari, I, the, the first thing that went to my mind wasn't like, oh man, I wish I had that or I wish I had that Ferrari. I was like, clearly that guy's way older than me. He has things that he's worked mm -hmm. for. Great. I, I inspire to have that one day. Fantastic. But the one thing I inspired to, it wasn't to have his car, his watch, was to have his freedom of spending. Like his freedom to be able to spend $200,000 on things that other people didn't even have $200,000 to eat with, you know, like, or, mm. or to feed their families. So I thought to myself, I said, this guy has a level of freedom that I don't have. And while I may not at the time have used it the same way, even if I had $200,000 saved, I would not have gone and bought a Ferrari and a gold Rolex at that moment. I still appreciated the fact that that person had the capacity. And as someone who didn't, I aspire to understand how that was possible. You know, so I think yeah. one of the things that occurs in people is when they're when their dreams are so far from them, so they can't relate to them, they don't look for what that path looks like. We talked about the path not existing, but, you know, it, the path to their dreams doesn't even exist in a way that they understand the dream. How many people look at a Lamborghini and assume it's very expensive? How many people look at a, a, a crazy watch that their favorite rapper wears and goes, that's out of reach. That's impossible. Like. I don't even make 200K a year. How could I ever own a 350K a year, uh, 350K Ferrari? Like that's impossible. But they don't understand that not all Ferraris are 350K. They don't understand what Ferraris cost what, what models exist, what they can be bought for. Like they give up on their dream because at the surface level of their dream, it seems so far from where they are. So because they're not investigating their dreams, and this is the reason why most people don't create a plan around something because it seems unattainable because they just don't understand it. Like they, they just Google Lamborghini and the first article that comes up is, you know, SVJ just breaks world record. And they're like, cool, what does that cost? $1.1 yeah. $1 million, are you out of your mind? Like, how am I going to ever get a car like that? I have a Nissan Altima. How do I get to a $1.1 $1 .1 million dream, right? It is so far, but who said your first car has to be the latest, greatest right. Lamborghini on earth? Like it, that's not how success works. It's a compounding interest kind of model, right? It, it compounds over time. And the more experience and the more money you make, the more you keep making of it. But that's that's where people disconnect. This is the risk reward thing. The, the reward just is misunderstood. So the risk is misassessed. So someone doesn't really make a jump for anything in their life. And that's pretty unfortunate. And I've learned through the years that, and we were talking about this before the show came on, but slow and steady wins the race. And, and mastery is not something like there's no substitute for time as it pertains to mastery. There are guys who will win in life because they timed their success, meaning they were like, hey, I'm at the forefront of this. I'm going to jump in and I'm going to do it and I'm going to take the risk. Nobody saw this. Maybe some luck, maybe some, you know, level of grind slash meets luck at some level. Uh, and timing, you know, obviously works, you know, to some extent. But I think what people don't understand is those are the exceptions, not the rule. And if you try to adhere to the exception, you'll always basically be behind because you're trying to become the exception without the capacity for the grind, even if it presented itself. 
So what happens is you basically give up on the rule of being slow and steady and growing. And, and as a result, you're kind of chasing that quick, like, will I make it? You know, it's kind of luck. Like, will I play the lottery? Will it hit for me or not? And then what happens is people don't realize that that, that shit is depressing too. You know, nine failures in a row on, on an attempt, that takes a toll on a human being too. You know, to be like, I'm not winning at anything. You know, it's like you yeah. get rejected nine times with the same approach, going out, asking a chick out, and you're not bettering your approach little by little, bettering your health, bettering your, you know, the way your body looks, you know, taking care of yourself. And you're just like, I'm just taking my chance of luck. Well, eventually you get declined enough. That yeah. you're like, I must be De one ugly motherfucker. Like, de demoralizing, <laughs> demoralizing, you exactly. know. And that yeah. takes a toll on you, too, you know, as a human. Yeah, I, I saw a comedian last week and he said, he goes, I considered going gay for a while, but I'd hate to find out that I was actually unattractive to men also. <laughs> so that's when you hit rock bottom, right? Pretty good joke. So and now the thing is that, you know, there's like, there's a couple of questions that always pop up. Like you and I go to these car gatherings and cars and coffees and we hang out with our car guys and, you know, people will walk up and they usually have two different questions. And this is how we kind of get a glimpse in their mindset. The first one will ask you, how much was that? Or how much did you pay for that? And those people, you can already tell, like you said, they're the fixed mindset. They just kind of look at things in the high level. They look at the price tag. I can never afford that. And then the other people are like, hey, what do you do for a living? Or how, how can I be able to afford something like this? They're asking the right questions because that was me when I was broke. And I saw somebody that had a big house and I'm riding my bicycle as a kid. And I'd see it and go, hey, what do you do for a living, mister? And I, would, I wouldn't say how much was your house. I would say, how could I get there? Or what do I need to do to have that in my life? And I've always been that curious one. And I was never shy about asking that either. I would see people with a nice car and I'd say, man, what do you do for a living? And they would just tell me, you know, if I was genuine and sincere about the question, they would just tell me, you know, it's like, cool. Now, not everything's going to be a fit. Like, obviously I didn't want to be a surgeon and things like that, but soon enough, you're going to start to find these different avenues of ways to get there. And nowadays it's a lot easier because you can go on the internet and find, find out what people earn. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what the young, like we're older, right? Like yeah. I'm 40 years old, you know, like mm -hmm. I, we didn't have the internet growing up. So yeah. if I wanted to, like we had the internet, but it wasn't what it is today. You know, we didn't right. have access to billions of people the way people mm -hmm. do today. I mean, if you want to find out what someone does today, you just go on Instagram, look at the bio, you know, that, mm -hmm. I mean, that might be a lie. That might be true, but at least you get an, a sense of what they do, you know? Yeah. Uh, but in the old days, like I had to go knock on my neighbor's house and be like, dude, you have a Ferrari. What the hell do you do? Like, wh yeah. what line of work are you in? Like, how do you have this? You know, like mm -hmm. we live in the same neighborhood. You have this. I don't like, what, are, what is it that I don't know? Right. But I think the better question to ask, regardless of this car show or approaching someone that has something, uh, you know, you can always ask you what line of work are you in? What is it that you do? That's absolutely a good question to ask. But I think something that I, I believe more young people should ask is how long have you done it? Nice. I think that, that, that will change the perspective of someone a lot. I'll tell you a story because, you know, I was in the like when I built my first investment business back in 2005, uh, I, I was doing really well and I wanted to transition to being online and everybody thought I was an idiot. And I was completely moronic for trying to teach online. This was 2008. They were like, hey, you're at the peak of your investment firm. You're making incredible money. You're getting nine figures in revenue. Why are you sitting here dreaming about a blog, a website and something stupid? And I was like, because I was giving myself the same thing I just told people, like that five years to mm -hmm. skill, to mastery, you know, and, and that gain, right? Like that constant growth. So I was like, it's going to take me five years to go from labor to skill, and, and literally took me five years to make my first 40 grand, which was a joke, but that's how long it took to get yeah. a skill, you know, and figure out what it was. And then it took me 10 years after that, you know, to start basically every single thing I start online makes a million bucks. And, you know, like at least in most cases, 90 days, best case, 30 days. But I think that the the difference in, in how people kind of understand that is one thing that I did after year four, I was frustrated. I wanted to quit. I was like fuck this online shit. Why am I doing this? I'm making so much money elsewhere. This doesn't make sense. And, you know, I asked an ultimate question. I went to lunch with one of my clients at the time. He was Tim Sykes. You probably know him, the penny mm -hmm. stock trader, you know, and uh, at the time it was my client because my investment firm was doing cars, watches and art and stuff. And it was buying uh, like cars. So he's like, Hey, I moved to Florida. We should talk. We should sit down and have a conversation. I said, sure. So we go to lunch and he starts telling me how he's making all this money, like 30 grand in like, you know, an hour while we're at lunch and he shows me, tells me all these other marketers are in craft, 
you know, like they're they're all lying about their income and stuff. It's all smoke and mirrors online. But he shows me on his phone. He's like, look, I'll prove it to you. Like literally I sat here at lunch with you, made 30 grand on PayPal, you know, selling horses. So I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. Amazing. Like this is real. I can visualize this in front of me. Hmm. But then I asked them the ultimate question that a lot of people don't ask instead of saying to myself, OK, so this dude made 30 grand in an hour. And I made 40 grand after five years, you know, like clearly I suck at this because he knows something. Mm -hmm. I asked them the ultimate question that completely revamped my mindset. I said, okay, how long have you been doing this? He said, 12 years. I said, great. How much did you make on year four going into year five? He said, I didn't make any money for eight years. Damn. So that completely revamped my mind because what it told me right there was that I was ahead. I wasn't behind. You know, I was like, hey, I'm half time through what you went through and I'm making something. So like, mm -hmm. that's incredible, right? And you've been doing this and you were making nothing teaching online. So I thought of that and I said, now my perspective is aligned to reality. And instead of quitting, I doubled down because I was going to quit and said, this is stupid. And instead of double down, and if I wouldn't have done that, not only would these conversations not be happening today, but a lot of the you know, online success people have seen and, and so on and so forth would not exist today because I just wouldn't have been in that space anymore. I would have been like, this is depressing. You know, 50K after five years, that's less than 10K a year. Plus I had two guys I had to pay. So it was like a third of that. You know, we're yeah. talking about like barely making 3,000 a year. Try that. I did that math the other day on my Instagram. I think it was like 30 cents an hour or something. <laughs> dude, dude, you, you were getting paid in enthusiasm at that point. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> you know, the thing is that I, I love the time concept here because I'm a big believer in that too. And I think that we see these things, especially the marketers on Instagram and things like that. They're like, hey, if you buy this course for nine ninety seven, dollars you're going to have a $100,000 course launch and you're going to make 100000 in one week. And everybody's like, oh crap. And, and so you buy the course. And here's the thing that when you look at the course, it's actually legit. There's actually good and valuable information right. in that. Exactly. And you go, okay, cool. But then you go build this out, you implement it, you create your funnel, you run some ads and then like tumbleweeds blow through your cart and nobody makes any money. And they're, they're wondering like, man, I just, I'm a, maybe I'm ugly or I just don't know what I'm doing or it's just not working. And the thing is, is they haven't figured out is that the people that are selling the course have been doing it, like you said, 10 plus years, and they've also amassed an audience. So yeah, you can have $100,000 in one week in a course launch if you have 500,000 legit followers. Like it's legitimately possible, but everybody wants to skip to past that. They want to skip past the impact to get to the influence. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes I see is like people doing the fake blue check marks and the fake this and the fake ma magazines. And they're not creating any real impact because nobody's reading those articles. We know they're fake. They're not really doing anything. Google doesn't even recognize them. When you go search them on Google, like Google's like, who the fuck are they, right? And so they're trying to get the result. Like you said, they want to be the 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 wealthy man, but not the man of wealth. I love that you kind of phrased it that way. That's kind of the way I think about it. It's like, how do you invest in yourself to go become the right person to be able to get that result? Everybody wants a shortcut process. And you know, there's a lot of good for information out there. But guys, the time, like, what are you willing to do over the next 10 years to get to the next level? Well, I think it's, it's, so it's definitely, you said they want the shortcut. It is a shortcut when you take the course, mm -hmm. it's the shortcut, but it's not the res the shortcut to the result It's the shortcut to the work. Unfortunately, the society we're in, if I came to you and said, Hey, I'm going to teach you basically all the financial tools you need so that in the next five to 10 years, you can be a man of wealth. Now, some guy listening now might say, oh, yeah, that's great. But are you consistently going to deliver for yourself in five to 10 years to see if I'm right or not? Probably not, because you're like, well, am I on the right path? You know, is this working or not? Uh, I want results now to prove to myself this works. So the, the marketing has changed to have to have some type of timestamp. And I don't blame the marketing industry because it's just how the environment is, you know, just like. Uh, there's a lot of industries where you would argue it's probably not the best uh, consumer way to go about something, but it's the only way it kind of works. Otherwise, the company wouldn't be able to even survive or make profits or anything. So the business world has become very dark in that way where you're kind of forced to follow that. Otherwise, and, and I learned that the hard way, like a, a person once told me I was going to write a, a book at the time I was writing an ebook. And he said, put a Ferrari on the cover. And I said, that's not what it's about. It's not about the car. It's about everything else. And he goes, well, who gives a shit about a book? No one's reading. 
it's a good point. Like if mm -hmm. you have a great cover that you love, six people read it versus you have a cover you hate, but 10,000 people read it, which one was more impactful, right? Was right. it the stupidity of the cover and the 900 people who said you're a jackass for putting a Ferrari on the cover and you're vain or whatever? Or was it the fact that you impacted 10,000 people versus six people? You know, I mean, these are mm -hmm. all business decisions, right? Like about how and what's important to you. But when you buy a course, you're buying a shortcut to the learning not a shortcut to the results. So, so that's the wrong expectation. If you're a man of wealth, you understand that. If you're seeking wealth, you don't, right? So that's where, again, the mindset shifts and, and you're making significant mistakes. I think that, you know, individuals, you brought up an interesting point about, obviously, people like me, for example, today can launch a new product and say, hey, here's the qualifications of that product. And I can instantly say 30 days later, here's a million dollars in my pocket, more than I had. Fantastic, it worked. The difference, though, I think where it's still important to take the course and learn is that while it is true that obviously without the followership, without the hard work, without the years before, the trust, the authority built in the space and everything else, it's going to be much, much harder to gain those financial results. It is also said that if I had access to my own, for example, separate course 10 years ago, I certainly would have made even more money because I would have started uh, with a very different baseline. I mean, I teach like watch trading in this place called Watch Trading Academy. And, you know, it took me 10 years to make 300K uh, a year in profit trading watches. It took my first student that I put to that vigorous program. He paid literally 10 grand for all the courses I have. It's a lot of money, but he made 300 grand in three years, meaning by his third year, he was doing what I was doing in year 10. Mm -hmm. So there is a significant difference, right? Like 10 years versus three years. But he couldn't have been sold as that. You know what I mean? Like it couldn't have yeah. been sold as like, hey, just do this. And in three years, you'll have my results in 10. It had to be sold in a more sexy package, you know, like how to make mm -hmm. 10K a month, blah, blah, blah. But but the intention was good. And this is where I'm going to kind of like, yeah, I, I want to not take too long on this subject. But I think one thing that's really important is a lot of people ask me, well, how do I do so well in course sales and over and over and over, no matter what, just keep doing it. And I tell people, it's like, I'm not a marketer. I'm a teacher with a marketing plan. There's a yeah. very big difference between a marketer who figures out what to market that people want to hear about and about a teacher that figured out how to get his teachings in front of people. I don't teach things I don't have experience in. I don't teach randomness. I don't come up with the next thing like, oh, Bitcoin's hot now. I'm going to talk about that because that's where people want to hear. Wow. I talk about the same things I've been talking about since 2008. So like nothing has changed. And I think that is the where the trust and authority is built in the teaching. So there's always a student that goes, well, if I want to learn that, this guy seems to really know what he's talking about because he's done it for so long. And everyone else keeps saying that's the guy to go to for that. So that's the type of authority that gets built. I also don't spend $30 million on marketing to make like 31 million and then have, <laughs> you know, like be lucky yeah. if I have 1 million left in my pocket, right? Yeah. Like, like we barely spend, you know, like a, a tenth of our, you know, revenue in, in ads. And we do so very conservatively in a manner that can be sustained because we're building a real business and we're not just shooting stuff at a wall, hoping it sticks and then saying, well, it worked or it didn't work next, next program, next thing, you know? Well, Hey guys, there's a lot of people out there with those two comma club awards that have actually used their own credit cards and bought their own shit to yeah. kind of show the revenue. I mean, you could fake all that stuff. It's well, they don't so, even check a lot of times if you did it or not. Like I know, I know people that have said they've gotten it and they've never done it. I've never used click funnel for anything. I think it's stupid, but yeah. nothing wrong with the program. You know, I think it works for some people if you need mm -hmm. it. Uh, that's another difference about longevity or thought. Let's say you want to go in this business, you can test using something like that. But in the long term, why would you want to ever use something like that? So like the mentality is basically like you're going to have to invest in your own built in your own ecosystem and your own everything because you believe you're going to be in that space for a long time. Uh, you know, when I started this, that's what I did. I was like everything custom, everything built, you know, no mm -hmm. platforms. There, There's hundreds of platforms where I could have gotten an extra buck, but I had to share that buck. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to be in here 10 years. I don't want to share my feedback for 10 years with people. You know, like it's yeah. not worth So I want to, we got a lot of listeners here that, you know, I'm in the car space. They love cars. They maybe dream about having that first six figure car. The way you teach things, people need to know this. I mean, I've, I've been doing this for 20 plus years. The way you're, the way you teach, you and I are aligned. Like you're at a much higher level on the bigger cars. But the way I buy cars, the methodology is very similar. And the way I manage the cars and the way I treat them and the way I sell them, 
But I think this is not information that most people understand. They they kind of just think everything's a depreciating asset because you know there's their gurus on the internet are telling you not to waste money on cars. Like you and I make money on cars. It's like people don't understand. Like, how can you drive such fancy cars and stuff like that? And then they realize like you made money on that. How did you do that? So let's 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 say a hundred thousand dollar vehicle, like something that's attainable to the the listener. What is the methodology that you would go through that, so they can actually afford to have these vehicles and enjoy them? So financial education online is crap because it's usually 10 years behind if it's mainstream enough, meaning mm-hmm. like rich dad, poor dad was like 10 years ago. Good idea then. You know, times have changed. Financial tools have changed. Financial principles have changed. But yet no one's updated kind of the ideology behind it. Mm-hmm. But the spread of the book gets bigger over time. So more people hear about it. They're just behind the curve, right? So financial literacy comes from an understanding of what it is that you want to do. Like instead of saying, which stocks do I buy? It's how does the stock market work? So if you want to really get into a six-figure car, you have to understand what is that six-figure car? What is it? How does it depreciate? How does it work? How does it break down? And, And this is the research most people ignore altogether because it takes time. It's easier to say, tell me what to buy. Is it going to appreciate or depreciate? We only understand those two words. We try to simplify it in a manner where we don't understand the object and how it functions. Like, so instead of saying, will this car depreciate or not? Let's understand that Lamborghinis today are different than Lamborghinis 10 years ago. Lamborghinis 20 years ago, one, they don't break down as much. They're an Audi product now. Secondly, they're incredibly easy to finance, something that wasn't around 10 years ago. So you have the, the tools have evolved. So has the behavior, and thankfully, a lot more rich people. So, so has the production. And as something's production rises, right, and its demand also rises, it creates a market for it. Something that didn't exist twenty years ago, where you were the only guy that could afford a Countach, you drove it, and nobody wanted to buy it because nobody knew about it. Why would they buy it from you? They buy it from the factory because it's not new. Today, an, an exotic car can have seven to eight owners within the first year and a half of its existence. And it wouldn't change anything. And I guarantee you, someone listening on this call today is thinking to themselves, well, I don't buy cars with more than one owner because that means the car has been abused. And I'm like, well, that's fine, but you're probably going to miss out on 90% of what's happening in the world around you because of your fixed mindset into what you believe for the last 10 years of how things should be, which is not true. You have to evolve and adapt faster than the opportunity itself. So the cars today can be used as basically a financial vehicle to park money. That is the difference. So what you need to assess when buying an exotic car is no longer what is it today, what is it worth, and how how much is it going to depreciate, but rather how well has it retained value over the last three to five years, and what is the likeliness of its retention of value at its lowest possible point. So if I look, for example, and I say, okay, so the lowest point I've ever seen a Lamborghini uh, Gallardo sell for is maybe like $90,000. Today, I'm making an investment of $110,000. If I call the dealer, how much is he trading that car for? He says $105,000. Well, now I have data points, right? It tells me what basically this item's lowest cash value is. If I need to exit it overnight and nobody wants to pay for it, it's $90,000. I've called two dealers that if I've made a purchase mistake here and I feel bad about it, they will pay one hundred five, dollars And I am myself paying one hundred ten. dollars These three pieces of data right there have revamped your entire mindset for one reason. Because right before this call, you thought you had to buy a six-figure car, and that was pretty scary, right? Like six figures. My God, you know how long it takes me to save $100,000, blah, blah, blah. But what, what I just told you right now, if you paid attention to the math, just means that you paid basically for a year of enjoyment for Lamborghini a $5,000 risk in its biggest case ratio of $15,000 risk. So a lot of people would go for their dreams if it only cost them 15000 And I'm not saying it will. I'm saying in its worst case scenario, it would. In its best case scenario, it would cost you $5,000. So you take a vacation in two seconds and you spend five grand on a hotel. You take a flight, you spend five grand for like, like business class per person to go somewhere. And yet you drive a car an entire year and you won't commit 5K to own your dream car, which will open doors for you, make you meet new people, give you a sense of what life should be like, and give you a new sense of enjoyment every single day for 12 months, not just for one trip. Now, this is the difference in how we don't think things true, right? We spend in one way, and we don't use that same methodology to think of other things, right? So what happens is we're willing to take that loss on the trip, 
because we think of a car as a hundred thousand dollar purchase and a trip as a ten thousand dollar purchase. When in reality, they're the exact same thing. And so, using good financial principles of understanding what it is our dreams consist of enable us to basically, you know, attain them. Yeah. And that's the argument here of everything you've heard on the show today is that you have to do the research. And the research is not how do I get the shortcut. The research comes on the financial tools that have evolved past your mindset. Your mindset hasn't evolved. The tools have evolved. Now you have to evolve your mindset every year to what's happening in the world. Like you can't be that guy that's like, I don't understand how Bitcoin works. I don't understand. It doesn't matter that you invest in it. It doesn't matter that you like it. It doesn't matter that you believe in it or not. Like I don't invest in Bitcoin. I don't believe in it. I think it's stupid. Other people will think it's fantastic that each person has their own capacity to understand it. But I have investigated my own version of what I know, and I don't believe in it, so I choose not to invest in it. But I don't just invest in it because my friend said, hey, I made $2 million in Bitcoin in five minutes, and I don't invest in it, and I won't not invest in it because my other friend called it a scam on the internet, right? Like, So I take my time, and I get to understand certain things because you know, having ideas as digital coins is something that is very much going to become a reality at some point mm -hmm. in the future. You have to understand that. It doesn't matter that you believe in Bitcoin or you have to understand what digital currency is and how it works. But but it doesn't matter in the sense of like investing in that way, you know, and, and thinking of it as like my friend said, so I have to do. And it's the same thing with cars. People base their ways on one buddy that said, hey, I bought a 599 Ferrari. It was nothing but headaches and trouble. I lost $20,000. Okay, well, your friend was an idiot. Like there's nothing about that. Just because he owned the 599 Ferrari doesn't mean he's the example of what 599 ownership in a Ferrari is. Mm -hmm. I would argue that there are many people who have terrible experiences with exotics because they don't follow a process. They don't understand how they work. They trust the local dealer. They get screwed. And then they go scream off the top of their lung. That is terrible. But you also witness hundreds of people on Facebook, on Instagram, enjoying their exotic car, loving their car, posting it more than they post their own family and telling you like how much it's they've enjoyed it, right? Like, you yeah. know, but those guys, somehow they're all lying. But the one guy that had a terrible experience, that's the criminal point I'm going to focus on because we do this, right? As a society, we, we hone in on the fear, right? How many yeah. times do we see a review and we don't actually read the review, right? Like, like I mean, think about it. We see a restaurant review. We go 4.2. We go, I don't care. That's not the type of restaurant. What's the one star say? What does the one star say? Yeah, but, but we don't even yeah. read like a couple of them. We see, yeah. you know, like it said they didn't pick up the phone. Okay, well, that has nothing to do with the experience at the restaurant, right? That's okay, right. they were busy. That day. You pick up the phone. Why do you care? Like, go try it. You know, don't don't think of it as like this is the do all and, and there's nothing else I can do about it. You know, I like the cars thing because observing you, you you're very analytical and you you're very keen on specs and making sure it has very specific options certain colors certain mileage limits and that's what most people kind of just fail they just think that hey lamborghini huracan like they're all the same the you know dodge vipers they're all the same like just they just kind of lump things in big categories but they don't understand like if you were to go buy a crap ass color that's because it's the lowest price of that version of car that you want you're probably going to get stuck with it. You're not going to make as much money on it. You're probably not going to enjoy it as much because every time you look at it, you go, man, I wish I would have bought the red one. You know, it's, it's understanding these things that you look at vehicles much like stocks, the way I, the, the way you yeah. analyze things. Like you watch the trends, you know, hey, they were depreciated. They bottomed out this market two years ago. They're on the upswing. So every vehicle that you know and every spec combination of those specific vehicles, you watch as trends. And that's why you have like the, the the finders type business that you go find those exotic cars that meet your criteria and the people that love them, they pay a little bit more because it's a service, but then they don't get stuck with them. They don't be able to enjoy those cars and sell them a year from now. Sometimes they actually make money on them. You know, that's the thing that most people don't realize. Like these exotic cars, we make money on these things. I'm going to make 500 grand after I'm done driving my Bugatti watch. And I'll post a case study all over the internet. Like, I made 200 grand driving a P1. I made 100 grand driving a Senna. You know, like it does, like, again, these things are things that people don't don't understand. And you can do this on a 30K level. You can do this all the way up to a 10 yeah. million dollar level. It doesn't make a difference. The The part is greatness. This is something you can use both for your, for business and for cars. Greatness will always be in short supply. Mm. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter that it's a humans, that it's thought, that it's action, that it's service that it's a great car, that it's a great spec. And if life is about supply and demand, which we understand this basic economic fact that when something is in short supply, uh, 
and greatness is always in high demands, you know, for anything, then it will always bring a higher amount. And, and you know, I, I try to get people to understand that, that it's about these specs. You know, it's about like, even when you buy a Lamborghini, uh, uh, today's Lamborghini Huracan is yesterday's Mercedes. Like people don't understand that because in their head, they go like, well, you know, uh, it's a Lamborghini. But remember back when Lamborghini first came out, Range Rover didn't have a $200,000 Range Rover. That, right. that, there was a difference in the two, right? So now you have a choice of an ultra luxury Mercedes for two hundred fifty grand, or a Huracan. The, these are now lifestyle choices. They're no longer status choices. So the guy that was driving the three hundred k car ten years ago now has to drive a million dollar car to be in that same status as in the same type of low supply. Like, hey, I'm that guy you've seen me running around. I got that money. Hmm. That status is that. It's changed. You know, a million dollars today in a car. Is that, I mean, look, I used to wear 30K watches. Now I work to wear a $400,000 watch. This is the same thing. The status is the same level. Like it plays the same game. It's not that I, I have to wear a $400,000 watch, but in if if my status is basically 20 years ago, I was wearing a 30K watch or maybe a 10K watch. 10 years ago, a 50K watch was like, hey, you're that rich guy with a 50K watch. Today, a lot of people are wearing 50K watches. There's a lot of Rolexes on the internet that are rose gold, beautiful, and bring 50, 60K. And watch markets have gone up. You know, things have gone up. And again, that is the cost, right? Like that, that, that the cost of that status has gone up too. You can't be like, there's 10,000 people today who can afford a Huracan, but I'm just as special as back when there was only 500. No, because there's now 500 SVJs. So unless you have an SVJ, yeah. you don't have a good lamp right now. So the point is that these things have changed and status has changed. And and again, the the lifestyle choice today is very different. And the systematic look at these cars as lifestyle choices also changed across the board by banks and financial uh, institutions that look at them as like, a guy wants a Lamborghini. Like even your insurance company 10 years ago would have been like, we don't insure your Lamborghini. That's something we don't do. You're going to go to specialty insurance. Today, six out of the 10 top insurance carriers have a Lamborghini program. Like it's not that expensive or they subsidize it to keep your uh, insurance in house. So like, again, these tools have evolved because the industry around them has evolved, but greatness will always be in short supply. Now, should we show them the cars or should we leave them guessing? I don't know if you feature video or is this just audio? Yeah, well, I mean, some people will see video. Some people will see video. So well, I'll, I'll give I'll, you I'll... a very quick yeah, yeah, I'll give you a quick one, so I'll be nice, so we won't walk, take too walk, much of their time. Walk through and like say what they are too for the listeners. This is his shop. He's going to take us on a little tour in his shop, and so I have I have three of these, so we're only going to see one because I can't go next door. Okay. Okay. So this is a Chiron. This is the new Bugatti Chiron. It's a 2019, uh, and it's basically white. It's sitting. Of course, we always mod everything. Mm -hmm. It's sitting right here in HREs with baby blue calipers. This is a 918 Spider Porsche. This is a matte rhodium paint with a, a red interior. Uh, blue Glocko, which is Tiffany blue. Uh, this is paint, not a wrap. Uh, Huracan STO with Anarchy wheels. On this side, we have the new Ford GT in the back. And then uh, 1998 uh, 4S993. Nice. Very, very good amount. And my daily driver here, the only uh, ever... In America, Brabus, uh, Ghost 2022 Black Badge. So that's just just a few of the cars in the collection. But and of course my mural, which I'm very proud of. Yeah, the <laughs> anime, cartoons. big anime guy. <laughs> anime, dude. I was I was I was raised with anime. I love anime. It's one of my favorite things. Yeah. So he's always got a revolving car collection. But he's what I like about you is you always share your true opinions on each car, no matter how cool they are. Like they're all cool. We love all of them. But each car has pros and cons. And your your YouTube videos, you'll be like. This one's bullshit because of this. Look at this expensive car with this crap ass switch. Like, what the hell is this? You know, and I love that you're just very blunt. Like the product is shit. The product is shit. It but you know, so everyone. many car guys, dude, so many car guys, especially exotic guys, will never point out a, a single pimple on their car because it's like a it's like a identity thing to them. Like if they point out a flaw, they somehow they're a flaw. But listen, it's the same thing as the guy with the it's the same exact thing as the guy with the Mustang that wants to race a Ferrari. It's no different than the guy with the McLaren that wants to race a Bugatti, right? Like mm -hmm. it, it happens at all stages, you know, like yeah. it's not just people sometimes think that identity crisis only happens to Corvette guys. No, it doesn't. It happens even to the 570S McLaren guy who puts a yeah. on in his car. It's like, I just smoked your SVG. I'm like, bro, you drive a 570S. My wheels are worth like the same price as your car. Like, calm down, <laughs> like, calm down. Like, it's okay. Yeah. You know, like, it's not like, there's nothing like 
You know, I I knew a kid, and this is something maybe people will relate to. Who put a unfortunately he passed uh, he passed away. Rest in peace. But he used to put a super Lugera uh, sticker on his Gallardo, and it wasn't a super Lugera. And I used to give him. Mm-hmm. And he used to wear a fake RM. He was thirty two years old. He had a beautiful car. He had a beautiful family, and he had a nice Rolex. But he wore his fake RM more, and he also put that super Lugera sticker on. And my argument to him was, why are you not proud of being a 32-year-old with a Lamborghini and a Rolex? That is already in the 1%, my friend. Like, like yeah. you have to realign your perspective to how great that already is, like how far you've already come. When you devalue that greatness by putting a fake badge on it or, or trying to be more than you are, you're, you're discrediting yourself. Like, yes. you're insulting yourself, basically. And, and I'm like, like, you have to be incredibly proud of, of how far you've come at that age, you know, and in mm-hmm. that, well, my friends have, you know, way better Lamborghinis and, and my other friends have these watches. Well, listen, everyone has their own path. Like, there's no, there, there's no, like, my friend has, I have a friend that's got a $150 million yacht. I, I don't go buy a $3 million yacht and go, well, I just wanted that. So, you know, I didn't want that uh, 30 people crew and, you know, that that money yeah. and the helicopter. I'm like, who needs that? I mean, who needs that these days when you I can don't even places? fly? I, can, I don't even have yeah, a pilot's like, what license. <laughs> like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm so... just sitting there like, holy shit, like my entire net worth is going to be used to basically buy this and operate it for six months. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's it's crazy out there. I mean, the comparisons are crazy. And, you know, I, I feel that especially social media has kind of amplified that the, the just feeling like low worth, low self-worth because you see other people with fancy things. And, you know, but I think about this is also, I don't think someone's truly successful until they build a succession plan. And that's what you've done. That's what I've done. We teach people what we've accomplished. We try to give them the same path. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that I see a lot of people that are financially successful. They're just kind of keep it to themselves. It's kind of like a, a scarcity mindset, despite their financial standings. And always blows my mind. So if you find those people that are sharing the way they do things and teaching people, like those people are gold. Like keep those guys in your circle. I, I agree with that. But you know, I don't think everybody is meant to teach. That's something I've learned when yeah. I had Secret Entourage, that online platform that was just hiring all these people to basically be speakers and teach and mm-hmm. everything. And, and I realized a lot of people aren't meant to teach. Like it's okay. Like not everyone's yeah. born a teacher. Some people are not. But, but I think one thing that's powerful about uh, really about being truly successful is living life through your own value system without having to live an experience that was created for you, but rather an experience you created yourself. Like you choose what experience you want to undertake that day uh, and, and you can and have the financial capacity to undertake it. Like mm-hmm. I want to be a teacher. I'm not forced to do what I do. Right. Uh, I could retire and not do anything at all and sit home with my family and, and enjoy maybe child time or whatever it is that that day I want to do. But I can still do that today and still teach because I choose to. And I think that that's, that's where real success comes in. It, it's having a choice, not not telling yourself you have a choice and not really having a choice because people do that too. You know, they're like, oh yeah, I, I have my job because I choose to, but deep inside, I wish I had my own company because I would be able to not report to that asshole. But at the end of the day, like if you don't convince yourself and you truly are authentic to that value system you want to create and the experience you want to create, uh, that's that's true success. And I think you'll notice that in people that are really successful, they don't need to impose the, their value systems on others either. They just live their life their way and they just yeah. go like, this is my choice. Like, I don't have to uh, abide by yeah. this other choice you have and I have enough money to also back my own choice, you know, and that's it. Like, that's that's where it leaves. You know, you choose one thing and I don't. Usually people, when they don't have their financial freedom, they're, they're very combative towards value systems imposed on them. I mean, think about like money gives you a chance and many people had this issue politically about vaccines and things like that. People with money didn't have to adhere to either. If you didn't have a job, you didn't care what your company was going to do. If you were the owner of the company, you could sue the state and delay mm-hmm. it and not do anything. Like again, you have all these uh, money was the byproduct of how you could avoid the things, the experience you didn't want to have, right? But if yeah. you had a job, you were at the mercy of the person with the money who owned that company. And, and yes, maybe people disagreed, but it wasn't your company to to form that agreement or disagreement with, right? If it was such an issue, then you quit. And 20 years later, you'll come back and say, hey, next time something like this happens, I'm not a sucker twice, right? Like, I'm not going to do that. And, and, and you win. And the thing is, you can 
spend a lot of time complaining about all the things life does that are unfair and, and uneven and how things work out for others better than you, which is going to always be accurate in one form, way or shape and other in life. Or, or you can accept that your path to 20 years of success starts today. And listen, you're 20 years old today listening to this, you'll be 40 and you'll be ahead of 99.9% .9 of the world. You're 30, you'll be 50. You'll still be ahead of 99.9% .9 of the world. You're 40, you'll be 60. You know, like yeah. there's plenty of 60 year olds who are not millionaires, not even multimillionaires, don't mm -hmm. have financial freedom. And you can be. The, the difference is, will you commit to something 20 years or will you just not start at all so you don't waste your own time? Man, I love this thing. We're wrapping up on the time here and that's because time is very valuable. And I think that's probably one of the reasons you and I also like watches and fancy stuff is we value time. It's just a very artistic way of, you know, showcasing time. And, you know, you, know, you, you teach a lot of courses, you have a lot of different things for people to help. So how would they find those things from you? The easiest thing to do is just find me a learn from pga.com. You'll find everything from exotic car hacks, watch trading Academy, and all of the books I've written on human consciousness, evolution, everything else right on there as well. Yeah. They're all great content. I vouch for all the stuff. I've seen so many people, my friends, I'm a member of two of those groups and guys go pick it up, go listen to those things. He'll, he'll really the unconventional thinking, the branding there. You'll find that there's a lot of things that you may have believed in the past that just don't really work today. And, and he's a really good guy to teach and learn that from. So thank you for being well, on the show, man. You, and I always appreciate you having me on. Always a great discussion and continued success to you and your audience. Thank you, man. So what are you going to go drive today? Today, I get to take my ghost because I feel like an old man. My back hurts. <laughs> so <I get> to <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you for being on the show again, man. And I uh, look forward to it. We got, we got to meet up in person sometime, man. We do this online I'm stuff down, all the time. Down at Palm Beach anytime you want. I'll take you around, show you around, hang out for a couple of days. It'll be a good time. Awesome, brother. Well, go have a good day, man. Talk soon, okay? Take care, buddy. Mm -hmm.